In this uh, video, we are going to uh, look at some Catholic objections to uh, biblical Christianity. So as we begin, I'd, I'd like to begin by uh, defining a few terms. Um, I think the terms Orthodox and Catholic uh, would be familiar to most people. These are two uh, big branches of uh, Christendom. Um, most people who might call themselves Christian would identify as either Orthodox or Catholic. And then we have a term called Protestant, uh, which originates in the Protestant Reformation, which took place uh, around 500 years ago. Um, it, there, are many, uh, there are many areas or there are many points on which uh, I would agree with uh, the Protestant teaching. At the same time, uh, I hesitate to identify myself as uh, a Protestant because uh, that, uh, the, the word is associated with a specific movement in history. Uh, the more appropriate term that would describe our position here in this video would be that of a biblical Christian. That means a Christian who uh, gives the Bible a supreme authority. So uh, people all over the world who give the Bible the exclusive and ultimate authority in their lives as a matter of principle can be called as biblical Christians. And there is a lot of overlap between the beliefs and practices that a biblical Christian might have and Protestant theology and practice. Okay, so those are some terms. Uh, to keep in mind as we look at some Catholic objections. So these are different, uh, uh, different types, you could say, of Christians. And uh, the Catholic Church or Catholic apologists would differ from biblical Christians on various points. And in this video, we are going to look at some of the objections that uh, the Catholic position has towards biblical Christianity and what is our response as biblical Christians towards these objections? So the first objection uh, that Catholics have to our position is that we do not give enough weightage to the patristic tradition. That means the tradition of the church fathers. Uh, Christianity as we know it today has a 2000 year history. There are many people who lived in ancient times they, uh, they had various beliefs and practices, and we don't pay much attention to that. That's the objection here. The uh, Catholic position can be summarized by this uh, statement from the Second Vatican Council document, which says that the church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Hence, both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. So uh, this is the Catholic uh, position that we should give equal importance to scripture and tradition. Now, why do we refuse this kind of uh, dual authority? The reason we refuse it is that such a position uh, violates or contradicts what the Bible says about itself. For example, here uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible speaks about itself. It says, all scripture is God exhaled. And the purpose of scripture is that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So, so many things can be mentioned in this context. But here I want to highlight this aspect. The Bible claims to be sufficient. In other words, uh, this is enough. You don't need to look anywhere else. Uh, in the book of Jude, uh, the theology or the body of Christian truth that Christians are supposed to believe is referred to as the faith that was delivered once and for all, which means that the revelation that God gave in the first century during the time of the apostles is complete. There's no need to add anything to it. There are many verses in the Bible which warn us that we should not add or subtract from the Bible, which means the Bible is an integral whole. And then the Bible also claims ultimate authority. If you read the whole Bible, you will find so many verses with this kind of tone. 
This is from Isaiah, this one example taken from Isaiah, the prophet. It says, as regards the law and the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And that's what the Bible says about itself. Either you agree with this or you're completely wrong. That's the kind of authority that the Bible claims for itself. So we biblical Christians, we give the Bible the position that it demands. Now, if you believe that the Bible is not true, then you need to reject it completely. That's the atheist position or maybe the position of a secular person. And that is logically coherent because a person is just saying something which is logically valid. He's saying that, well, the Bible says all this about itself, but I disagree with it. And so I will not give any regard for it. But we would like to point out that the Catholic position is in a way self-contradictory. On the one hand, you say that you believe the Bible, you honor the Bible. On the other hand, you do not give it the honor that it demands. You claim to be honoring something and then you don't give it the honor that it demands. The Bible claims to be sufficient, complete. It claims to be an integral whole and it demands the ultimate authority. So you take it or you leave it. It's also good for us to look at the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read the Gospels in the New Testament, you uh, see that, you, you realize that the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, they came to Jesus on many occasions with various controversies. And they, know, they wanted to see what he had to say regarding those controversies. And time and time again, uh, the response of the Lord Jesus Christ is this way. Uh, he does not say, uh, you know, have you, uh, are you familiar with this tradition that the rabbis had? No, that's not what he says. He says, have you not read in the book of Moses? Have you not read in the law? It's like this. So Jesus always upheld the authority of the Bible. Uh, when he came, um, he came to this world uh, many centuries after the Jews had developed their scripture as well as their tradition. And uh, he never said, I've come to fulfill your tradition, but he said, I've come to fulfill the scripture. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's appropriate for us to give uh, the Bible the same authority that Jesus did. Another objection that Catholics have to biblical Christians is that they accuse us that uh, we are uh, reading the Bible on our own and then interpreting the Bible on our own. So it, it looks like a free fall all, right? I read the Bible, I come to my own opinions, you read the Bible, uh, you come to your own opinions, and we are all proud thinking that, you know, I'm right and the other person is wrong. That's the accusation. What's the Catholic position? According to Catholicism, it says, uh, the, to the Catholic Church belongs the final word in the understanding and meaning of the Holy Spirit in the words of the Bible. No explanation of the scriptures which contradicts the truth constantly taught by the infallible church can be true. So here, the Catholic position is that only our leaders, only the Catholic church has the right to interpret the Bible or to say, this is what the Bible means, which means even if you read the Bible and you see it says something and the Catholic church says the opposite, what they say is that you need to submit to what the Catholic Church says. In this context, perhaps uh, Catholic apologists would also like to quote this verse to us. There's a verse in the Bible which says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So the Catholic argument is that you shouldn't be interpreting the scripture privately. I mean, if you're so curious, you can read it but you shouldn't be interpreting it. For interpretation, you should just ask us what the meaning is and go with that. That's the Catholic position. Now, why do we reject this position? Uh, to answer that question, first of all, uh, this verse needs to be clarified. Um, in, in, in this case, in the case of this verse, uh, the King James translation is uh, not very good. If you notice here, the word is is used, that's present tense, but the tense in the Greek is actually the perfect tense. And it speaks about the scripture having come. So 
a more literal translation is as follows no prophecy of scripture has come by any individuals unlocking the word that is translated as interpretation in the king james is a greek word that refers to something being unveiled something being opened out something being stretched out for everybody to see and then uh, the next verse in verse 21 peter says for prophecy did not come by the desire of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit so here in this passage peter is not talking about christians interpreting the bible he is talking about how the bible was produced how has scripture come to us okay what he says is that scripture has not come to us because paul or peter figured out something on their own but rather they spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit so this verse is not talking about uh individual christians reading the bible at all it's talking about how the bible was produced how did the writers of the bible actually write the bible did they write their own thoughts no they wrote what the holy spirit guided them to write okay so why do we refuse after a uh, refuse magisterial uh interpretation there are various principles or there are very various passages in the bible which indicate that uh god wants individual christians to read and understand the bible for themselves so for example here it says the people of beria were more noble than those of thessalonica in that they re- received paul's message readily and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so so when paul came to their town and paul was preaching to them you know they didn't ask Uh, okay let us consult the magisterium and find out whether this is the right interpretation but they looked at the old testament themselves and they tried to cross check what is written in the old testament with what paul was preaching to them and god commends these people for being noble which means that god wants us to understand and obey the bible by ourselves look at the example of the lord jesus christ um this is shortly after his resurrection he met uh, two disciples who were walking on the road to emmaus and uh, when he started talking to them he understood that there were many things from the old testament which they did not know so what did he tell them he said o oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself now these two people had not consulted any magisterium their problem was not that you know the priest had already told them what to believe but they were not believing it that was not the problem the problem was that they were confused uh, when they uh, witnessed the crucifixion of jesus christ because they did not expect the messiah to be crucified so in other words they hadn't figured out the prophecies in the old testament and jesus is telling them that you should have learned and you should have understood and you should have believed all these things and if you haven't figured out all these things so far then let me explain it to you i will explain it to you and jesus never said that you know i am the official representative of the church so i am authorized to tell you what the interpretation of the bible is he just said i'm your fellow traveler at that point of time his identity was not revealed so speaking just as a fellow traveler he said look this is what the old testament says look at the old testament and understand for yourself this is what should happen to the messiah he should die and then he should be raised again from the dead so the lord jesus christ himself expects believers to read and understand the bible for ourselves now this does not mean that all of us go on our own tangents the holy spirit the bible says the holy spirit indwells in believers and helps them to understand the truth of god then secondly god believers in isolation but god has put believers disciples of his in local churches and in the churches we discuss the bible we study the bible we share our thoughts 
And then if one person has something which is wrong, uh, everyone else will be reviewing it and critiquing it. So errors will easily be noticed. So uh, when we read and try to understand the Bible for ourselves, we are just following biblical instructions, the Lord Jesus' instructions, and we are cross-checking things with one another and the Holy Spirit guides us. So this is why we refuse magisterial interpretation. Another objection that Catholics have when they look at people like us is that uh, you people have so many denominations. We are united. We are one church, and that's the way Christ wanted it. But you people are disunited. Look at the number of denominations that are there. Look at the number of different churches and the different names of churches, the different networks of churches. You people are so disunited, but we are united. So we must be right. Uh, to answer this objection, uh, first, it's worth looking at uh, just how united the Catholic Church is. Uh, on the one hand, it's true that the Catholic Church is one big organization. But uh, when you look at the beliefs and the practices inside the Catholic Church, you find a good amount of difference of opinion. Uh, for example, this is the Latin Mass. And there are many conservative Catholics who believe that uh, the right way to conduct a mass is the Latin mass. But not everyone agrees with that. So this is a news report uh, saying that Pope Francis disappoints fans of Latin mass. Perhaps he conducted a mass uh, in English or in some other language, or he made some statement uh, to the effect that the Latin mass is not necessary. So here you have uh, a difference of opinion uh, within Catholicism. Uh, there are many Catholic priests who uh, believe that uh, it is necessary to Indianize Christianity by incorporating Hindu rituals, Hindu customs, Hindu ways of doing things. And needless to say, their conservative counterparts will strongly disagree. Um, in, in some European countries, it's happened like this, that there are uh, Indians living there and when uh, there are Indian Hindus who celebrate their Hindu festival, um, some of the Catholic churches have accommodated them and other Catholics are very upset by this. So uh, these are differences of opinion, major differences of opinion within the Catholic Church. Here is another example in which uh, a conservative uh, Catholic journalist complaining that the Fatima journal equates traditional Catholics with the Taliban. So you have uh, the liberal section of Catholics who are not happy with the conservatives and vice versa. So there is a section of Catholics that believe that interfaith initiatives are good and there are others which consider them to be an outrage. In fact, there are so many, um, so many areas on, with, on which Catholics disagree. Uh, there is a, a movement within Catholicism in South America called Liberation Theology, and the details of it are not relevant for us. But then what we need to understand is that uh, there has been opposition in the Catholic Church against liberation theology. At the same time, uh, there has been friendliness also. So you have different points of view. There are some popes who would not who would not tolerate liberation theology at all. There are other popes who are more accommodating of liberation theology. There are some conservative Catholics which go so far as to accuse the pope of spreading heresy. So uh, there is a lot of disunity within the Catholic Church uh, itself. So, you know, when you point out something in others, uh, there is a need to look at oneself also. In fact, just consider the first page of the Bible. The first page of the Bible says that uh, God created the universe in six days. And he created different animals individually. He created man also individually. And there are some conservative Catholics who will agree with that. And there are some Catholics who will say that, you know, this is just a myth that has to be taken um, figuratively, or it's just a parable for us to understand some lessons 
uh, we all know that uh, monkeys evolved into man. So Catholics actually don't have a unanimity uh, regarding the first page of the Bible. Um, and as you progress in the Bible, there are many other things on which Catholics disagree on, on, on birth control, on sexuality, on evolution, on uh, the end time events, and so on and so forth. Now, the next area that we would like to focus on in answering this objection is how important is unity? So here's a quote by um, a Christian apologist and professor at uh, Oxford, uh, C.S. Lewis. He says, seek unity and you will find neither unity nor truth. Seek the light of truth and you will find both unity and truth. So unity is not more important than truth. And so truth is what we need to give a premium for. It's not just C.S. Lewis that says it, even the Bible says it. If you want to boast about unity, then maybe you need to look at the Lord Jesus Christ. It says very clearly in the Bible that there was a division among the people because of Jesus. Now, why would Jesus bring division among people? Well, it has to do with the truth. Some people will believe the truth regarding Jesus and others will not. And therefore, there is disunity. And the same thing applies today. God has given us a revelation. And uh, not everybody agrees with this. And that's why there is some amount of disagreement or disunity. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, says that it is necessary for divisions to be there among you so that those who are approved may be seen clearly. Not everyone is living an equally good Christian life. Not everyone is walking equally close to God. And therefore, they, it is inevitable that there will be some divisions or disagreements. Uh, it's helpful to consider the example of, uh, of a class. If you consider uh, a course that students are taking, um, all of them have attended the same lectures. All of them follow the same textbook. Now, is there unity in their answer sheets? No. Every answer sheet does not agree perfectly with the other. Perhaps there is some agreement, but not perfect agreement. Why? You know, there are some questions asked in the exam and different students give different answers to them. Why is that? Because the student's understanding of the subject is not perfect. So in the same way, my understanding or my fellow Christians' understanding of God's revelation is not perfect. So it is understandable that there might be some disagreements between him and me. Uh, this is just a consequence of the reality of what truth is and the finiteness of the human mind. It doesn't mean that we are on the wrong footing. Now, thinking of disagreements, uh, I want to make a point about biblical Christians and how we view one another. Uh, all these are uh, well-known, uh, illustrious, uh, devoted Christians that come from our network of churches, which is called the Brethren Assemblies. So at top left is Anthony Groves, who was a missionary. Uh, George Muller is famous for his orphanage, uh, which operated on the principle of faith. Uh, Emmy Cherian is a well-known preacher from South India. Uh, Charles McIntosh is a well-known uh, author and preacher from the United Kingdom. Uh, Walbrecht Nagel was a German missionary in South India. Uh, Frednick Arnott was a Scottish missionary to Africa, and the McGregors were uh, missionaries from New Zealand who came to India. Now, all these people come from the Brethren Assemblies, and so do I. Now, in my eyes, are these the only people of God? I mean, am I disunited with other Christians to the extent that I don't consider them as Christians? Certainly not. These people are from the same church background that I am from. But that does not mean that I don't accept other people as people of God. Now, look at these people here. Buck Singh was uh, an Indian missionary. Watchman Nee is a church planter, Bible teacher, and missionary from China. C.H. Spurgeon was a Baptist, uh, a Baptist uh, preacher and pastor in the United Kingdom. 
Uh, now, Buck Singh and Watchman Nee founded their own network of churches, which was somewhat similar to the Brethren Assemblies. Spurgeon was a Baptist. Amy Carmichael was Presbyterian. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. Uh, Robert Estian, uh, who lived uh, nearly 400 years ago, was also a Presbyterian, like Amy Carmichael. Richard Wombrand was a Lutheran. And John Newton was an Anglican. Now, these are all people from different churches. They've got different labels that are attached to them. But I consider all these people as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Although I do not identify with their label. Now, what's the reason? We follow the same Jesus Christ. We believe the same gospel. They believed the same gospel about Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which speaks about Jesus coming to this earth to die and to rise again for sinners and to offer salvation as a free gift to sinners. Now, because these people accept the biblical gospel, that's why they are my brothers and sisters in Christ. There may be other people with the same labels. Uh, if they don't accept the gospel, then they are not my brothers in Christ. So uh, the different labels that biblical Christians might have might give the impression of disunity, but we are far more united than perhaps outsiders would recognize. Now look at these names. These are names of Christians who lived in the past. Now, many of these names were given to them by Catholic agents who persecuted them, who conducted an inquisition, and who had many of them put on trial and killed because of disagreement over theological issues. So these people have different names, but all of them are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Not because of their name, but because they believed the same gospel and gave the authority to the same Bible that we do. So we are all united. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, despite our different names. Now, just like the students' answer sheets, we may not agree on everything, but we agree on uh, a foundation. A foundation is that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and he has come to offer salvation freely to all. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ and we all uphold the authority of the Bible. So we are not as disunited as you think and the level of disagreement that is there has to do with the nature of truth. Another objection is that Catholics would say that our church dates from the time of the apostles. Your church is something new. Well, the church that I go to in the city of Thane in India, uh, it was established in 1997. So that means it was nearly 2000 years after the time of Christ. Whereas the Catholic church is supposedly the oldest church, the original church that Christ and the apostles founded. This is the Catholic claim. Now, I'm going to respond to this in two parts. Uh, the first is to compare this or to, to juxtapose this with other similar claims. Well, we have the Orthodox Church also. They also claim the same thing, and yet they differ from the Catholic Church. Their beliefs and practic practices are similar, and yet they are different. So this, this priest here represents a church, in South, a church in South India, the Orthodox Church in Kerala, and they believe that they were established by the Apostle Thomas, and they did not know uh, anything about the Pope or the Vatican or any such Catholic uh, icon until European colonizers uh, appeared on the scene. And if you look at these two groups of people, well, what will the Jews say to them? You know, we are older than you. You know, we are the original people of God. So uh, what I want to point out is that this Catholic claim of antiquity is not a unique claim. There are other people making these claims. And if I should become a Catholic just because the Catholic Church is uh, the oldest, well, then why shouldn't I become a, a Jacobite? Why shouldn't I become an Orthodox Christian? Or why shouldn't I convert to Judaism? That's the obvious question. Now, we'll, we'll examine this Catholic claim of antiquity. Um, part of this claim is this list of popes. 
So Catholics believe that the Apostle Peter, one of the disciples of Christ, was the first pope, and uh, he was succeeded by other popes. And this is a long line of popes uh, right until today. So this is the claim of the Catholic uh, Church, and we are going to uh, uh, scrutinize this claim. Uh, this list, or the first part of this list, uh, is, <clears throat> is taken from a book called Against Heresies, written by a person called Irenaeus. And this book is dated 180 AD, which means it's dated about 150 years after the time of Christ, or after the writing of the New Testament. Uh, this is Via Appia, the Appian Way, uh, near Rome, on the outskirts of Rome, and this is considered to be the site of the death of Paul and Peter. So uh, there are second century writers that say that Paul and Peter died in Rome. I think Tertullian is one of those writers. But now let's pay some attention to Peter. Notice that in this list, Peter is said to be the first pope from AD 32 onwards. Now, AD 32 is the time that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. Now, if you have ever opened your Bible to the book of Acts and the Apostles, uh, you would see that uh, the scene is not in Rome, it's in Jerusalem. Peter was in Jerusalem for a few years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So this is obviously a factual error. Peter was not in Rome in the year AD 32. Okay, so the question is, for how long was Peter in Jerusalem and where did he go after that? Now, the Bible does not have the complete history of Peter's life, but it has some things that we ought to notice. When Paul wrote an epistle to the Christians in Rome, he greets many people individually there in Romans chapter 16, and Peter is conspicuous by his absence. Now, Paul is writing in around AD 50, between AD 50 and 60. And if uh, Peter was in Rome, it is quite understandable that Paul would send some greeting to him. But there's no such greeting. Moreover, when you read the epistle to the Romans, when you look at the greetings there, you notice that there are multiple churches in Rome. There is no single church in Rome. In Peter's epistle, first epistle, in chapter 5, Peter says that I'm writing from Babylon. I'm sending greetings to you from Babylon. Now, Babylon is not at all anywhere near Rome. Babylon is an old name for Iraq. Now, some people say that Babylon is a cold word for Rome. And so when Peter says Babylon, he must be referring to Rome. But that's not factually correct. I mean, today Babylon may be a code word for Rome because uh, many Protestants believe that the uh, Roman Catholic Church is the fulfillment of the Babylon that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 17. So today, in the context of prophecy, um, you may have uh, Protestants referring to the Roman Catholic Church as Babylon, but that is not the case in Peter's time. So when Peter says Babylon, uh, the natural interpretation is that Peter is referring to Iraq. Then, the second epistle of Peter was written near his death, and Peter writes in this epistle that I'm about to die now. So, so what? So you should remember the things that I've been preaching to you from the start. And he mentions certain things in his epistle. Uh, there is no hint of the papacy, Peter doesn't say anything like, you know what, I'm the first pope and I'm just about to die, so we need to have a new pope. You guys are going to have a new pope soon. He doesn't mention anything of that sort. So when we look at this Catholic claim to antiquity and we compare it with the New Testament, we find that it does not hold water. Peter might have visited Rome near the end of his life, but he was certainly not a pope sitting in Rome. He was certainly not there um, immediately after the time of Christ. Uh, the last book uh, of the Bible, one of the last books of the Bible to be written was the book of Revelation, and it was written around AD 95. 
when uh, the emperor Diocletian had imprisoned the apostle John in Patmos, the island of Patmos, and there uh, God gave John a vision, and that is the content of the book of Revelation. So the book begins with letters to seven different churches. All of them are located in uh, Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey. And if you read these letters, you will find that in every case, the Lord Jesus puts full responsibility on that particular local church for all the good, the bad, and the corrective action that needs to be taken. In other words, there's no hint of Roman Catholic hierarchy in these letters in the book of Revelation. Every church is autonomous. Every church is local. Every church takes its own decision. There is no hint that there's a Pope sitting in Rome and everyone is supposed to listen to what the Pope says. When you read Revelation 2 and 3, nowhere does Jesus say that, you know what, I'm not very happy with your church because you are not listening to the Pope. And I'm very happy with your church because y'all are listening to the Pope. There's nothing of that sort. Each church is fully independent and fully autonomous. So the Roman Catholic, uh, the Roman Catholic position or claim to antiquity uh, does, not, uh, does not hold water when we look into the New Testament. Now, this is Irenaeus who had given us that list of popes. And he says like this, that uh, Rome is the most ancient church known to all. So in the first line, you have a historical mistake. The oldest church is not the church of Rome. It's the church of Jerusalem. And we know that by reading the book of Acts in the Bible. So he says that Rome is the most ancient church founded and organized of Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. That church, which has the tradition and the faith, which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles. For with this church, because of her superior origin, all churches must agree. This is a view which is being expressed close to the end of the second century. But you can make out that when Arrhenius puts forth this view, he is making mistake upon mistake. The church at Rome was not founded by Paul, it was not founded by Peter. When, when we read Paul's epistle to the Romans, uh, Paul says that, you know, I'm happy to know of your existence. I want to come and visit you. I want to preach Jesus Christ to you people also. I want to preach the gospel in Rome also. I've been trying to visit you. So far, I've not been able, but one day I hope to visit you. This is what Paul says to the Romans. So it's obvious that he did not found this church, and yet Irenaeus says that he did. As we saw, Peter was nowhere near, near Rome uh, during his middle, middle ages or during his early life, uh, his early ministry, and therefore he did not find he did not found this church. So the whole logic uh, behind this Roman Catholic hierarchy that is set up at Rome is flawed. Um, if you look further at um, the, the, the trends that were taking place, we understand that there was a movement in which Rome gradually became superior. Now, this second quote is from Polycrates, who lived in Ephesus, which is far away from Rome. And he says, we, that is, we Asian Christians, we observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away and so on. Uh, for in Asia also great lights have fallen asleep, which shall rise again on the, on the day of the Lord's coming. All these observe the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel. So Polycrates is saying that, you know what? We are also great guys. We also have a claim on what Christianity is because great people have lived among us also. Apostles have lived among us also. So you, all of us, all Christians should follow our custom. You know, we celebrate Easter on the same day as Passover. So you should also follow what we are doing because we are also great, because great people live among our midst. But on the other hand, you have the Romans saying that, no, we are the great guys. We are the superior church. Easter should not be held on Passover. Easter should be calculated with a separate formula. And eventually the Romans won this contest and Rome became superior. So you see that the Catholic Church, which is headquartered in Rome, is not a hierarchy. It's not, it's not a hierarchy that Jesus and the apostles founded. It's something that gradually evolved over time. This is the second century. And in the third century, you find uh, further evolution. 
look at Tertullian from Carthage, which is also somewhat far away from Rome. He says like this, I would admit your argument if the writing of the shepherd had deserved to be included in the divine instrument and if it were not judged by every council of the churches, even of your own churches among the apocryphal and false. So uh, Tertullian's subject is actually not our subject. He's talking about a certain book called The Shepherd of Hermas. And he is uh, arguing whether this book is valid or not valid as part of the Bible. But in this argument, he makes reference to your own churches when he's writing to the Bishop of Rome, whom we would today call a Pope. But when uh, Tertullian addressed him, he does not consider him to be the head of the church, but he considers himself, uh, he considers this so-called Pope to be the head of a certain section, a certain number of churches. So here you see the evolution of the Roman Catholic hierarchy taking place in the third century. Now this belief became stronger and stronger. Cyprian of Carthage says, uh, he cannot have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. Now, Paul or Peter never said anything like this. But Cyprian is saying this around 200 years after the time of the apostles. So you see that within two or three centuries, this belief evolved that there has to be a big institution and salvation is to be found in this institution. That's the kind of view that Cyprian is, uh, uh, is expressing here. And that became standard Catholic theology. Um, there was an emperor, a Roman emperor called Constantine. And uh, he lived in the fourth century and he was a pagan. But one day he saw a vision in the sky. That's what he says. He saw a vision in the sky and uh, it was a cross. And because of that, he claimed that he is becoming a Christian. And he brought about a lot of changes. Uh, the Edict of Milan um, promised that churches wouldn't be harassed. If there was any church property that was, uh, that was confiscated as part of earlier persecution, then that property would be returned. Then Constantine called the Council of Nicaea. He said, you know, there was some controversy raging in the Christian church because there were some people, some bishops who did not believe in the deity of Christ and others believed in the deity of Christ. And Constantine, Constantine said, you know, I don't know whether Jesus is God or not, and I don't care also, but I care for the unity of my empire. And religion is a good so I want all of you bishops, you sit together and you decide once and for all whether Jesus is God or not. I'm not going to tolerate any dissenting opinions after that. So Constantine convened this Council of Nicaea. And later on, uh, an emperor who came after, the, after Constantine, he uh, gave the edict. He issued the edict of Thessalonica, which made Christianity the state religion. So here you see the further evolution of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. So when Catholics say that our church is the original church that Christ and the apostles founded, that's not true. Your church is something that gradually evolved over three or four hundred years. Uh, this bishop of Rome who lived in the near the end of the fourth century was the first to call himself the Pope. So it's, uh, it's very convenient to uh, make a list and say that Peter was the first Pope and so on and so forth. But we find that that is not supported by history. That's not supported by the New Testament. In fact, the writings of the church fathers in the second, third and fourth centuries show us that the Catholic belief of, uh, you know, one church headquartered at Rome is not something that Christ instituted, but it's something that evolved over three or four centuries. Uh, could salvation be there in an old institution like the papacy or the church that is headed by the popes? Actually, there is another old institution, and that is the... Uh, kings of Judah. Now, unlike the papacy, the king at Jerusalem or this kingship or this royal line was anointed or appointed by God himself. God made the prophet Samuel 
anoint David to be the king. And all these people whose names are on the screen here, uh, at least on the right, on the, on the left side, they are all sons of David. So they're descendants of David, successors of David. I mean, the Catholics might speak about papal succession, but here there's royal succession, a succession which was instituted by God. Okay, so what did God do with these kings? He destroyed them and he sent them in, sent them in exile. And that was because they disobeyed, disobeyed him. They went away from the truth which was written in their own Bible. So what we understand from that is that what matters is not an institution in itself, but whether that institution is sticking to the Bible. Salvation is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is found in the words that are written in the Bible. It's not found in an institution. And then we have an objection. Haven't Protestants done evil things? And this is uh, a sort of counter objection uh, to the objection that we give. Uh, we point out that the Catholic Church has done evil. And so the Catholic Church counter argues that, well, Protestants have also done evil things. Uh, it's an unfair comparison, actually, because there is a huge difference in scale. But anyway, here's an example. Uh, this person's name is John Calvin. Uh, one of the leaders of the Reformation in Geneva. And he had one point on which he agreed with the Catholics, and that is he killed a person because that person did not believe in the Trinity. So Michael Servetus was put to death by the Protestant leader, John Calvin, because of theological disagreements. You know, what an evil deed. So Protestants have also done evil things. Now here we need to remember our discussion on authority that we had earlier in this presentation. A Catholic believes that his church is infallible, that his Pope is infallible. So if the Pope has done something wrong, or if the Catholic church has killed people in the name of religion, well, that invalidates Catholic faith because, you know, a supposedly infallible institution has done very wrong things. Now, our authority is not John Calvin. Our authority does not rest on any particular leader. Our authority rests on the Bible. So if John Calvin does something wrong, that proves that John Calvin was a bad person. It does not invalidate my faith because my faith is based on the Bible in contrast with the faith of a Catholic, uh, which is based on the Catholic hierarchy and the magisterium. One final objection. Sometimes Catholics say that you people are just taking the Bible literally when it should be taken figuratively. Okay, so when, when we point to the Bible and say, you know, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, this is how we are supposed to uh, go about our Christian life, this is how church is supposed to be conducted, and so on and so forth, Catholics will object that you're just taking the Bible literally, and that's not the way the Bible was meant to be taken. But is this really true? Look at these two groups of people. At the top is the Catholic mass, uh, in which uh, the Catholics, uh, the Catholic Church teaches that the host, that is the bread, gets converted to the body of Jesus, and the blood gets, the, the wine gets converted to the blood of Jesus. I mean, this is an actual transformation that takes place. And if you ask them why they believe this, you know, they may give many reasons, but one of the reasons given is certain statements in the Bible. Jesus said, this is my body. Uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, so he spoke to the Jews about uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Jesus did make such statements. And here we see that Catholics are taking it literally. Whereas below you have a group of biblical Christians and they are celebrating the Lord's Supper and the same bread and wine is there in the table at the center, but they don't believe that it actually gets converted to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, they have their Bibles open and they're probably reading the words of the Lord Jesus. He said, this is my body. 
but they are taking it symbolically. They believe that when Jesus said, this is my body, he just meant that the bread is a symbol uh, of the body. And we are remembering the Lord Jesus Christ when we celebrate this Lord's Supper. So who's taking the Bible literally here? Uh, we, as biblical Christians, don't blindly, indiscriminately take the Bible literally all the time. Yes, normal speech, normal written material is to be taken literally. Language would not have meaning otherwise. But there are some times where the literal meaning obviously uh, does not make sense or is not true, or there is something in the text which indicates that the symbolic meaning is to be taken. And that is when we take the Bible symbolically. So while we interpret the Bible literally on, uh, on ma in, in many passages, uh, we are not doing it indiscriminately. We are doing it because there's no reason to take it figuratively. So it obviously has to be taken literally. We do interpret, we do interpret the Bible figuratively in some places. Now, this is a statement that the Lord Jesus Christ made in the Bible. Are you going to take it literally or are you going to take it figuratively? I mean, there is every indication in the context that this has to be taken literally in the sense that not that Jesus is a road made of concrete or something like that, but he is the way. That means salvation is to be found only in Jesus Christ. No man comes to God except through him. Well, what does the Catholic Church say? Uh, Pope Pius uh, the Ninth. Uh, he made this statement that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the vicar of Jesus Christ. Salvation is to be found in him. Salvation is to be found in the Catholic Church. If you're out of the church, you have no salvation. If you're with me, you have salvation. This is what the Pope said. Now, this is another bit from the Bible. It says that there was an upper room. This is the first church, not at Rome, but at Jerusalem where Peter, James, and John, the disciples of Jesus was there, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, also was there. And this is the last mention of Mary in the Bible. She was one of the believers, one of the Christians, one of the disciples of Christ in the Jerusalem church. That's who Mary was. Well, what does the Catholic church say about Mary? It says she's the immac immaculate mother of God, ever virgin, having completed the course of her earthly life. She was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. There are many more things that the Catholic Church says about Mary. but None of those things are written in the Bible. So it's not a case of literal versus figure. It's not lit. The issue here is not about whether you want to interpret the Bible literally or figuratively. The issue is, are you going to be true to the text or are you going to directly contradict the text or say something which is completely foreign to the text? So that's the issue here. So the objection is invalid. We are not taking the Bible literally indiscriminately. We take the Bible literally where it is meant to be taken literally, where, there is, where it gives no indication of having to be taken figuratively, and we try to be true to the text. So that's our position as biblical Christians. So in this video, we looked at different objections that the Catholic Church has to the biblical Christian position, and we looked at some of the responses that we have. We hope that uh, you learned something here, and we hope that you will consider these issues seriously. May God guide you and bless you. Thank you very much.